A clathrate is a cage that is made out of small molecules. This is one example of a clathrate. They don't all have this exact same shape, but they all have some sort of complicated polyhedral shape like this. Clathrates, like any type of cage, are capable of trapping something on the inside. So a clathrate can hold a molecule on the inside of it. In this experiment, we're gonna be making a clathrate out of the urea molecule. Urea is a pretty small molecule, and so our clathrate will have its little urea molecules at every single one of the intersections of all of the faces of our clathrate. And again, we don't know if our clathrate is going to have this exact shape to it. It might have a slightly different shape, but regardless of its shape, we know that it'll have urea molecules at all of the um, intersections at all of the faces. In this experiment, our goal is to determine what type of molecule is going to fit inside this urea clathrate. And we're gonna try two different types of molecules that have pretty different structural features. One molecule that we're going to um, attempt is a small but very branched alkane. This molecule, 2,2,4-trimethylpentane, seems like it's a pretty good candidate for fitting inside this clathrate because it's really little. Well, maybe we can take it and just put it right on the inside of this clathrate and trap it inside this little urea cage. We're also gonna try a very different alkane. So this is going to be a very long straight chain alkane with 16 carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. This is hexadecane. So this is a very, structurally a very different molecule and we're gonna see if maybe the hexadecane molecule would fit inside the clathrate. Now remember, our clathrate maybe won't have this spherical type of shape to it, um, so we shouldn't judge which one of these alkanes is most suited for the clathrate based on the picture that I've drawn here because we don't know exactly what our clathrate looks like. As I said, in this experiment, we're gonna take these two different types of alkanes, we're gonna mix them together in a combined solution, and then we're gonna make the urea clathrate. And we're gonna see if the urea clathrate traps the 2,2,4-trimethylpentane or if it traps the hexadecane. Let's watch. We're gonna be starting with about 2.3 grams of hexadecane. We are going to be using about 2.3 grams of hexadecane. Hexadecane's freezing point is right around room temperature, so I have it in this beaker of warm water. It's just helping it melt. And we're gonna measure it right into this 50 milliliter beaker. Hopefully enough of it is melted. We're gonna be using about 12 grams of urea. This bottle tells me that I should use a boat. This is a weighing boat. It's got sides on it. When you're weighing a large amount of a solid, it's much better to use these boats than just pour it on the paper. Here is that little beaker of hexadecane. And now I'm going to be adding the 224-trimethylpentane right into that same beaker. I've got five milliliters of the 224-trimethylpentane already measured out. Now this little beaker has both of the alkanes in it together. I'm just gonna set it aside and let the alkanes mix together while we work on the urea. And here's all the urea that I measured out. I'm gonna be using this Erlenmeyer flask to dissolve the urea. It's really important that I get the urea completely dissolved before I add that mixture of alkanes. I'm gonna be using methanol to dissolve the urea, 50 milliliters, pour that straight in. The urea is not gonna dissolve easily in this methanol, so I'm gonna to have to help it dissolve. First, I'm gonna be using the stirrer on the hot plate, so I'll get that going, and the stirring is going to help it dissolve. 
Also, I'm gonna be gently heating the solution to help it dissolve. I'm going to cover up this mixture of alkane so that none of them evaporate while we're getting this urea dissolved. And while the urea is dissolving, I'm gonna monitor the temperature of the solution just to make sure that I don't get up to the boiling point of methanol. Methanol boils at about 65 degrees Celsius, so I wanna to try to keep this solution around 55 to 60 to stay pretty far away from the boiling point. The urea is now completely dissolved in the methanol and it's ready for me to add the mixture of alkanes, the hexadecane and the 224 trimethyl pentane. I'm going to be um, really careful about getting 100% of the alkanes transferred into this Erlenmeyer flask. So I'm going to use this technique of back pouring a little bit of the solution into that same beaker, rinsing, and then pouring it again. Hopefully that washes out all of the alkanes. Now right away I can see that the solution is already starting to get a little bit cloudy which means that a uh, clathrate has already been formed and it is going to begin precipitating out of this solution. I don't want it to precipitate or crystallize too quickly. So what I'm gonna do is pull it off of the hot plate and just kind of slowly bring it down to close to room temperature. I'm gonna bring it down to about 30 degrees Celsius, which is just kind of on the warm side. Once the temperature gets down to 30 degrees, I'm gonna put it into this ice bath and let it finish solidifying the rest of the way. This has been sitting on ice for quite a while and as you can see, we have a lot of really nice white precipitate formed. This white precipitate is our urea clathrate with one of the two alkanes trapped inside. I'm gonna filter it out, and as I'm filtering, that white solid that I'm collecting is the urea clathrate with either 224 trimethyl pentane or hexadecane trapped inside. The alkane that is not trapped in the clathrate is still a liquid, so it's passing right through the filter funnel down into that um, Erlenmeyer flask. It's gonna end up in a waste container. I'm gonna rinse my clathrate with some ice cold methanol. And then once it gets rinsed out, this rinse is gonna help rinse out, you know, any of the alkane that did not get trapped in the clathrate. And once it gets rinsed, I am going to let it sit overnight and dry completely. This is our alkane clathrate. We're gonna get a mass on it. There's quite a bit in here, so I'm gonna be using a watch glass to transfer it. And I think that the stir bar is in here. So this is actually a lot crunchier than I expected it to be. I'm gonna try to not make a mess. I think that's my stir bar right there. So this has kind of frozen. It kind of feels like ice. Um, It's definitely not a fluffy powder like we normally get when we do a recrystallization. I'm going to dig that stir bar out before it gets completely buried. All right, there's our mess. It's now time for us to identify which alkane was trapped inside our clathrate. I'm just gonna write, inside the middle of this clathrate, I'm just gonna write alkane, because we don't know for sure exactly which alkane is trapped in there.
So in order for us to identify the alkane that's trapped inside this clathrate, we have to get it out of the clathrate. We have to break the cage. And the way that we do that is by adding water. Water is known to break apart or decompose a urea clathrate. So when we add water, it's just going to break apart this whole entire cage and we'll be left behind with just the alkane, whichever one it might be. It could be the trimethyl pentane, it could be the hexadecane. Once we've isolated this alkane, we'll be able to characterize it using IR. I've transferred the clathrate to a small beaker and now I'm gonna be adding the water that is necessary to decompose the urea clathrate. It's not going to decompose very easily, so I'm gonna be using this warm water bath to help it dissolve. And I'm just gonna leave it in this water bath until all of the solid has been dissolved. All of the solid has dissolved, which means that our urea clathrate has decomposed and the alkane has been released. And we're now going to extract or isolate the alkane from this urea water mixture. We'll be doing this in a separatory funnel. Now I'm about to do something really stupid that I'm going to talk about before I actually do it. This extraction is going to be done with methylene chloride. Methylene chloride has a boiling point of about 40 degrees Celsius. The solution that I just poured into the separatory funnel is a solution of warm water. It's not boiling, but it's pretty hot. And you can probably tell that because the inside of the separatory funnel is really steamed up. I was supposed to cool that solution in ice water bath before adding the methylene chloride, but I, I missed that step in the instructions and I just carried on. Now, because this solution is so hot, when I pour the methylene chloride into the separatory funnel, it's going to instantly boil. And it is going to um, boil right up out of that separatory funnel and splash around a lot. This maybe wouldn't be that big of a deal, except for methylene chloride is really toxic and it's suspected to be a carcinogen. So you're gonna notice here that as soon as I finish pouring it in, I remove my gloves immediately to change them get a fresh pair of gloves that isn't contaminated with methylene chloride. A lot of the solution splashed out into the hood and you know that's what the hood is for. It's there to keep keep us safe as we're working in the lab. But again that was a really stupid thing that I did on my end. It's always really important to pay attention to the temperatures of your solutions and pay attention to the boiling points of solutions that you're adding. But now that the crisis is over, I'm just gonna carry on with the extraction process, um, shaking and venting the separatory funnel. In this extraction process, I am moving the alkane from the aqueous layer into the methylene chloride layer. The methylene chloride um, solvent is more dense than water, so the methylene chloride layer will be at the bottom of this separatory funnel. And the methylene chloride layer is the layer that contains our alkane. So once I feel that I've gotten enough shaking here for the solution, you can probably see that the methylene chloride is still boiling inside this separatory funnel. It's still too hot. Um, once I've done shaking, enough shaking and venting, I'm going to drain the bottom layer into my collection beaker. That bottom layer, the organic layer, is the layer that contains the guest alkane. Once I get that bottom layer drained out, I'm gonna repeat this extraction a second time, hopefully without any disasters.
Our last step here is to clean up this organic layer using sodium sulfate anhydrous. This is a drying agent, meaning that it will absorb any water that may have accidentally made its way into that organic layer. To use a drying agent, you're just going to take a very small scoop of this powder and add it to your solution, swirl it around and see what happens. The drying agent will never dissolve in the solution. It will always be a solid. You are looking for either the formation of a clump from that white powder or free floating granules of white powder. If the drying agent is absorbing water, it will clump up inside that beaker. That means that water is present. And if it clumps up, you just need to add a little bit more. And you need to continue adding the drying agent until it doesn't clump up anymore. The drying agent that clumps will never unclump itself. So we're not looking for all of the drying agent to no longer be clumped up together. We are looking for a point where when we add drying agent, that added drying agent doesn't clump up. If you're looking carefully, you might notice that this drying agent is um, not only is it clumping up, which means it's absorbing water, it's also causing that solution to become more clear. The presence of water in that solution gave it initially kind of a hazy, cloudy appearance that is now going away. It looks like we're pretty close to being dry because we do have, you know, some smaller clumps that are present inside that beaker. And uh, as I swirl this around and watch the little granules float, once I can see a few of those granules that are continuing to float freely and not clump up with the other granules, I'll know that the drying agent has done its, um, done its job and removed all of the water. After the drying agent has absorbed all of the water in the solution, I am going to carefully transfer just the liquid into a clean beaker. It's really important that I don't accidentally transfer any of the drying agent. I don't want to have any of that present in my final product. I'm going to be transferring this solution into a small beaker that I have pre-weighed to make things easier for me tomorrow. After I get it transferred, I'm going to cover it loosely and let it sit overnight. Overnight, the methylene chloride will evaporate and it will leave me with just the pure alkane, which I'll then be able to identify using IR. This is the alkane that we have recovered from the clathrate. We're going to take a mass of the alkane. And one thing that I've done to make this a little bit easier is I pre-weighed this beaker when it was empty. And so I'm gonna put that right here. This is the mass of the empty beaker. And here is the mass of the beaker with our product in it. Here's the alkene from the clathrate. We're going to identify it by testing its, uh, measuring it on the IR. I've got the liquid tip in place for the IR. I'm just gonna put a little bit of the alkane on the, on the diamond and then kind of trap it pretty quickly under that tip. It's difficult, oh sorry. Are you still recording? Yeah. Oh, it's difficult to um, get an IR of a liquid because they're they just kind of slide around on the surface there, and sometimes if they're volatile, they can evaporate before you get them trapped with the with the tip. This looks like a really clean spectrum. Should make it very easy for us to identify what this alkane is. This is a very pure sample. Um, so there's, um, like we would expect for an alkane, there's not a lot of peaks in the IR. I'm just gonna select the, the few that we actually have, and then I'm going to um, save this for analysis.